Hello and welcome back to Wendigo a Go Go. You can just call me Wendy. So today this video is not exactly paranormal. It's more just a legend, but it's something that I found very interesting and I hope you do too. If you live in Great Britain or Ireland, this is probably old news to you, but I'm betting for the rest of the world, this is something they likely haven't heard of. I know it came kind of out of left field to me, and I've noticed a lot of the uh, sites that discuss it tend to lean, lean more towards the fringe. So, what am I talking about? Well, there's an Irish and Scottish legend that a Princess Scota, or Scotia, claimed to be none other than King Tutankhamun's sister, otherwise known as Maritatan, married either a Scythian or a Greek man, depending on the source. And for those who don't know, Scythians were a nomadic people of the Eurasian steppes, uh, particularly in what is now Iran. Uh, the man's name was Goidel Glass, and the pair sailed to Ireland, where they founded the Gaels, otherwise known as the Scots, or the people of Princess Scota, who later invaded Caledonia and Argyll, and founded what is now Scotland. There's a myriad of variations on the legend, and I will touch on a few of the seemingly more major ones, uh, such as one where Skoda is the daughter of a pharaoh named Singris, and I should note that the name Singris really does not appear anywhere outside of this myth. Uh, he's not an actual pharaoh that we know of. Singris was claimed to be a contemporary of Moses. Uh, Skoda married a Babylonian man named Nio, Yule, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, and the pair had a son, who then was none other than the aforementioned Goidel Glass. Throughout these legends, the relationship between Skoda and Goidel change a lot. Uh, another variation, which I believe is more Scottish than Irish, says Goidel Glass was Newell's grandfather, and had met Moses, and was cured of a venomous snake bite by Moses, who then promised Goidel that there would be no venomous snakes on the island that his descendants were destined to inherit. And of course the people of his grandson Neil and Neil's wife Princess Skoda later settled Ireland before it is said they defeated the Picts and settled Scotland. There is even one variation in which Goidel was an Egyptian general, or at any rate, worked as a general in Egypt before fleeing with his wife Skoda along with the Hebrew slaves. I should note here, it's rather interesting, the word Gael, as in Gaelic, did not actually appear in English until the 18th century. The word was originally Goidel in Old Irish. Uh, and throughout this video, I will probably be butchering the pronunciations of these Irish words, and I apologize. There was also a legend where the Gaels were born in Egypt uh, and wandered for hundreds of years before finally settling in Galicia in northern Iberia and became the Galicians. One of their kings, whose name varies considerably depending on the source, uh, Mil Espan or Milesius or Miled, later settled Ireland and founded the Milesian people. And of course, again, depending on the variation, his wife was an, was an Egyptian princess named Skoda. This is a different Skoda <laughs> than the one who founded the Gales with Goyle Glass. I could open up a whole can of worms regarding the legends of the origin of the Gales and the Milesians, but we'd be here a while and I'm trying to just focus on Skoda. So it's safe to say that this is a well-known and arguably well-loved legend. But the question is, is there any truth to any of it? And after researching this video, I think the scope of that question may be a bit beyond what I can do justice for. Particularly since it's difficult to separate what aspects of Gaelic history have actual supportive evidence and which are more likely just pure myth. There's actually a lot of debate among historians as to the exact origins of the Gaels. Uh, and what I've been reading indicates that there isn't a lot of clear archaeological evidence. So, uh, bear with me, I do have some interesting points to make. 
One of the biggest questions that I have about this legend is do any of the time periods line up? So, you know, the legends name Moses and then more recently Tutankhamun. I don't think Tutankhamun was ever a part of the original legends. I believe that's more of a fringe theory that's developed recently. So, does that fit with any of the evidence we have that tells us at what period the Gales first settled Ireland? I looked up this, <laughs> you know, researched this question and I kind of went nowhere because, as I stated before, there really isn't much of any archaeological evidence to tell us when the Gales, in fact, first settled Ireland. In fact, it's been suggested by some historians that the Gaels and the Britons, both Celtic people but uh, formerly considered to have different origins, may actually have uh, the same origin in the Beaker people, which came to the British Isles, or who came to the British Isles, um, around 2500 BC. While other historians hold that uh, the Celts may have arrived around the start of the Iron Age, so as late as 500 BC. We do know that Ptolemy referred to a people living in Ireland around the 2nd century AD who claimed to descend from Milesians, and we do know that the Gaels traded with the Romans. Prior to that, however, we don't know. So there are some sources that are now considered to be not exactly historically accurate, such as uh, the medieval text The Annals of the Four Masters. Medieval histories are not always the most reliable, but the annals place Milesian rule as starting around 1700 BC. Tutankhamun died around 1324 BC, and archaeologist William G. Dever wrote that if Moses was indeed real, he would have lived around the 13th century BC, so about a century removed from Tutankhamun. So, this doesn't really prove or disprove anything, other than telling us that if the legends are true, they likely would have taken place roughly the 13th century BC, give or take. Though that doesn't necessarily affect the Milesian myth, as no well-known figures like Moses or anyone like that was ever named in the Milesian myths, so we can't really base research on anyone named there. Now, Tutankhamun did indeed have a half-sister, Meritaten. She became queen and married the successor to their father, Akhenaten, Pharaoh Smenkare, and later was most likely regent until Tutankhamun came of age. Of some interest here, however, it's not known what happened to Smenkare and Meritaten. They actually just kind of disappear before Tutankhamun took the throne. As of yet, there's no evidence as to what actually happened to them. Uh, the predominant theory is that they may have both died due to a plague that was sweeping through Egypt at the time. But since there's no evidence at all, I suppose we could let our imaginations wander and come up with some possibilities. If you want to try to find a connection to the myths of Skoda, I suppose you could say that they may have ran for their life or were exiled. Um, Akhenaten's rule was incredibly controversial and arguably very hated. So it's possible they may have been seen as being too uh, connected to Akhenaten and uh, hated by a lot of people, perhaps uh, it put their lives in danger. We don't know. <laughs> it's definitely intriguing, and maybe in time we'll make new discoveries that will shed light on what happened. But I think it's not terribly likely that Meritaten became Skoda. As far as we can tell, the earliest written reference to Skoda is a text from the year 828 called Historia Britonum. So a good, you know, 2,000 years or so removed from when it's alleged to have happened. Uh, this was also the first written source of the tales of King Arthur, interestingly. Um, though in this text the tales of King Arthur are different than what we think of today. There is no Knights of the Round Table uh, or Merlin, those are all later editions. Arthur here was referred to as an Anglo-Saxon war leader, not a king. Also, the text claims that Britain was first settled by Trojans, which, you know, there's not any evidence to support. So, 
it doesn't lend a whole lot of credibility to the legend of Skoda that is within the text. That said, some people do believe that the legend of Arthur may be based on highly embellished oral histories of a real person, so maybe there's a chance that it could be the same with Princess Skoda. There's also a later text from the 12th century called the Book of Leinster, which recounts the legend of Skoda as well. It's actually referencing something called the Labor Gabala Eren, I hope I pronounced that right, which is another medieval Irish collection of narratives of the prehistory of Ireland that scholars today regard as myths. So, with that said, is there any physical evidence? Well, there is actually a location in County Kerry, Ireland, known as Scotia's Grave. The area around it is known as Scohin, which is a diminutive of Scot. The name Scota means, in fact, blossom. So the diminutive of Scot means a wee flower or little flower. Uh, it is said that Princess Scota was buried there after being killed in battle in the nearby Schlievmisch Mountains. However, I was unable to find any suggestion that the area had ever been excavated archaeologically, so with no real proof of any kind, it's most likely just a local legend. On the Ancient Origins site, David Halpin wrote an article about Princess Skoda where he tries to link the name of the Egyptian god Thoth with the Irish legend of the Tuatha Dé Danann, which were uh, sort of godlike beings. He states that Thoth was also known as Thut and Thout, and that the term Thutida means Thoth's crossing, Thutidat means Thoth's journey by boat, and Thutidai means Thoth's storm, which he connects to the legend written again in the Laborga Bala Eren that the Tuatha Dé Danann arrived in Ireland in dark clouds. Now that may sound like a bit of a stretch, but while doing something completely unrelated to this video, I actually stumbled across something very interesting. Apparently, there are actually very real and very documented similarities between the Celtic language, Semitic languages, and Afro-Asiatic languages, in other words, ancient Egyptian. Linguists are studying these similarities, which are present more in the structure of the language than the vocabulary and they have a few different theories as to how this happened. One theory, of course, being contact between the cultures, uh, but it is important to remember that there can be other explanations, and for all the nitty-gritty of the explanations of the similarities and how it might have happened, I'm going to link in the description to the original video by Langfocus because it's a lot of information to include here. There are two other interesting pieces of evidence. The first was found during an excavation of the Mound of the Hostages near Tara in Ireland in 1955 by Dr. Sean O'Rourdon. Allegedly, the skeleton of a 15-year-old boy was found which was carbon dated to around 3,800 years old, and who had been buried with a necklace made of faience beads that supposedly matched similar beads found in Egypt. Now. This story seems to be shared around a lot on a lot of fringe websites. Um, the most reliable source I was able to find for this was a summary of a book by Dr. Morish O'Sullivan. The book seems very credible and accurate, and does mention the skeleton, but only refers to the beads as being exotic. No mention is made of any connection, any relation to Egypt. That said, I suppose it's possible that the author of the summary may have simply left out that detail. I also suppose it could be possible that any such connection may have originally been downplayed by the archaeologists, possibly to keep an academic career in good standing. Um, or, you know, people could just be connecting them to Egypt in order to try to support their own beliefs. We don't know. The other thing that was found was in Yorkshire, um, and this is actually very well known and documented. The remains of several ancient boats were discovered over a period of years, starting in 1937 and the most recent being found in 1989. They're known as the Ferriby boats, and were initially thought to be Viking longboats, but carbon dating placed them to around 1350 BC. 
though the ages of each different boat varies quite a bit, the earliest one being around 1870 BC and the latest around 400 BC. The earliest specimens are actually considered to be the earliest examples of sea craft in Europe. Now the boats are said to be of a type made in the Mediterranean in that time period, and they were made with a wood, specifically alder, that is not known to have been used in boat making in the Atlantic European region in that time period. Coincidentally, the dating does seem to match up to the dates that we formerly established uh, around Tutankhamun and Maritatan's time frame, about 1350-ish. But again, that doesn't necessarily prove anything. We could be kind of seeing what we want to see and clutching at straws here. So lastly, I want to address some news that went around a few years back that a large percentage of British men are related to Tutankhamun based on a genetic study. That study was actually published by a Swiss company that I, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name of, Igeni <laughs> or Igenia, Igene, Igene A. <laughs> based on a screenshot from a documentary about a DNA test that was done on Tutankhamun. There is no real evidence from any legit studies to support it. However, there is genetic evidence that the people of ancient Ireland actually had Middle Eastern heritage. But these people were those who were present in Ireland around 4000 BC. So, as far as we can tell, long before the arrival of the Gales. There's also genetic evidence that the Gales did in fact migrate from northern Iberia, lending some very little credence to the Milesian legends. There's also been a study done specifically on Scottish DNA that has revealed very diverse uh, origins of the Scottish people, including from Asia and from Africa. And in fact, the study stated that about 1% of Scottish men are direct descendants of Berbers, which are uh, people native to North Africa. So I think with our current knowledge and discoveries, we don't really have any evidence that supports specifically the legend of Princess Skoda as it's written. Personally, I am somewhat inclined to believe that there may have been some form of contact between Celtic people and Egyptians in ancient history, and I'm willing to concede that it's possible that the legends, much like those of King Arthur, may have been based on embellished oral histories of a real person. But I don't think the legends, as they're stated, have any truth to them, except for possibly some of the Milesian tale. So what about you? What do you make of all these curious fragments of possible evidence? Do you know of a variation that I didn't mention? I'm sure there's a lot out there and I didn't cover all of them. Uh, do you have a favorite? <laughs> Let me know in the comments below. This has been Wendigo Coco signing out. This black lump back here is Hala the Paranormal Poodle. We hope to see you again next time here on our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day. Peace. He states that Thoth was also known as Thut and Thout, and that the term Thut Da means Thoth's crossing, Thut Dat means Thoth's journey, and sorry, the bleh, the bleh.